Today, we would like to talk about the art and science of tapering opioid medications. So here's our agenda. Um, we will go through some quick housekeeping and accreditation um, information. The bulk of our conversation, um, we will hand over to our faculty, Dr. Andrea Rubenstein, from Kaiser Permanente. Um, at the end um, of the call today, we'll have some, a little bit more open time to talk about progress and bright spots in um, what various organizations are um, implementing. Dr. Andrea Rubenstein is our faculty for today. She is the chief of the Department of Chronic Pain at the Santa Rosa Medical Center. And um, this is a really engaging talk that I have seen um, Andrea give that talks about tapering opioid medications with a really um, compassionate and whole person um, view of your patients. And then with that, I'm going to pass the ball to Andrea. Great. Thank you, Christine, and thank you to Kelly Pfeiffer and everyone for inviting me here today. It's an honor to talk about what I am passionate about, which is the safe use of opiates. Um, I've titled this talk, The Art and Very Little Science, because it is just that. There is an art to doing this, and there's virtually no science on how to take a patient and get them off or safely reduced in dosage when they're taking opiates. It's something we do need uh, to have some literature and some science given to us for this, but right now what I'm gonna share with you is my in the trenches learning of how I've been doing this over the last eight years. Where there is some data, I will show it, but an enormous amount of my approach here is really uh, self-learned. And so with that, let's see. My, my objectives today, as Christine said, are to identify situations where tapering is appropriate. It's not always appropriate to help people learn to design the most appropriate type of taper for particular patients. And this, I really want to stress that this is an individualized process. And finally, to give you some skills at troubleshooting taper problems to avoid derailing. These tapers almost never go smoothly or according to plan, so you can kind of count on needing some strategies for helping out when uh, this gets rough. As was mentioned, I have nothing to disclose, but I do want to stand on my soapbox for just a little minute on this particular topic. Uh, over the last one to two years, most of you have probably felt uh, the change in direction of opiate prescribing, let's call it that to start with. We had been in a period of very liberal prescribing, Suddenly, the brakes are being put on, and there is a massive effort to try to get patients off of these medications. What concerns me about this approach is the tendency to blame the patient for the situation that they find themselves in. And I think it's imperative that as physicians, we own this mess. If this is an opiate epidemic, we, we caused it, we spread it, we failed to contain it, and we have to own that. And what we're in a phase now is really trying to clean up a mistake that we made. And blaming the patient or treating them somehow like they've done something wrong is often completely untrue. So are there patients who have abused prescription drugs? Absolutely. Are they the majority of patients? Absolutely not. One of the ways to have a conversation about this is to, I find, when I'm with a patient that I want to talk to about tapering, is starting, as I just did, with saying, wow, I really owe you an apology. The medical service, the medical industry service has not done the right thing, and we're now going to fix it. And I actually find that patients are pretty receptive to admitting that we made a mistake in some of the ways that we used these drugs and some of the ways that we prescribed them in people that we started on these medications with no knowledge of how to stop it. We didn't monitor patients correctly. And I find that's actually really helpful for me and for the patient to, to start with the tapering conversation 
as really something that's uh, an error on our part, not on the patient's part. So I will now get off the soapbox, but I'm upset when I see programs that are very oriented towards somehow this, the, the patient is abusing, the patient is escalating, the patient is having aberrant behavior. Okay, so I want to start, uh, this is kind of a raise your hand. <clears throat> I'm going to ask several questions throughout this, and I just want to sort of see a show of little WebEx hands. If you believe that opiates are safe and effective in selected patients when used long term. So raise your hand if you think that that's true. There's no right or wrong answers. I'll just tell you that to begin with. What is an opiate taper? It seems like an obvious question. An opiate taper is a progressive amount, is a, is a progressive decrease in the amount of opiate tapen, taken. And that seems self-explanatory, but this is only half of the answer. The other half, and more important half, is an opioid taper is a progressive decrease in the amount of opioid taken with the goal of leading to reduced risk and or opportunity for greater overall quality of life. And here's the kicker for the patient, not for you, <laughs> not to meet a metric, not to uh, get a bonus. Or uh, There's a lot of craziness being tied to opiate prescribing now, but, the, but I really want to make sure that Whenever we're dealing with a taper, our goal is to make this patient better, to reduce their risk and make them better. So when do we taper? Well, this is a, about the best explanation of when to taper a patient I've ever seen. It uh, comes from a book written by my colleague here in Santa Rosa, Dr. Tabitha Washington, that says, you taper a patient simply when what the drug is doing to the patient is more than what the drug is doing for the patient. I think that says it as about as perfectly as could be said. And so in order to, do, to know then, we have to both be able to understand what the drug is doing to the patient and what the drug is doing for the patient. Then we compare and we see, do we have a good balance there? And in order to do that, you need an instrument. And this is the instrument that I have developed and that uh, my department uses. I actually print this out on an eight and a half by 11 inch piece of paper when I go in to see a new patient. And I have a marker and I highlight these boxes as they come up during our talk. What I think is really important about this instrument is that you'll notice that abuse and diversion over here on the left is a piece of the puzzle, but only one piece of the puzzle. This is the part that's getting all of the attention and everybody's checking for all of this. But there's equally, if not more important, medical risks associated with opioids, psychological risks that are associated with opioids, and functional issues that can really affect the way a patient lives. And we need to screen for these in order to be able to fully ascertain all of the things that this drug might be doing to the patient. So throughout this, I'm going to present some cases, and you'll see how I use this tool. So who do you consider for taper? Well, number one on my list are what I call motivated patients. And in my practice, I am seeing now about two patients a week, this is relatively new, who have asked to see me for the purpose of getting off opiates. They know that I can do this, that my team is pretty good at this, and they actually want to come off. The second group of motivated patients are the patients where if you actually ask them, hey, if we could lower your opiate dose or maybe even get you off completely without increasing your pain or decreasing your function, would you be interested in trying? I think that's a, how you phrase that question is really important. If you say to a patient, would you like me to take away your pain medication, they're of course going to say no. But what's Implied in here is this idea that we might be able to make you better. And often those patients will sign on and say yes. Yeah. The second group is young patients. And a young patient is a good taper candidate because they have such a long time horizon for bad things to happen if they remain on. I also like to taper people who say it's not working. You know, they come in, doc, I got to get something for my pain, it's not working perfect time to have the tapering conversation. 
as well as patients who say it takes the edge off. And we'll talk a little bit more about what I think that means, what I think someone's telling you when they say that. I think it is a good idea to consider tapering anybody that has obviously diagnosable hyperalgesia, increased pain from being on opiates. And we have to remember that these, as much as they treat pain, these drugs cause pain. And a huge amount of the pain that our patients have on a daily basis is probably being caused by the very opiates we have them on to treat their pain. So we'll talk a little bit about hyperalgesia and what that looks like. Patients with declining function despite being on opioids. Now, this could take the form of missing work, not being able to do basic activities of daily living. I sometimes call it the Costco test. Can you go to Costco? How, how often do you go to Costco? Uh, and if they used to be able to go to Costco and they can't anymore, their function is declining. And the purpose of opiates is to improve function. So obviously, if they're on an opiate and their function is declining, something's wrong, and perhaps it's time to talk about a taper. Patients on opioids and what I call complex polypharmacy, that's really any other drug that crosses the blood-brain barrier. Some of these are more problematic than others, but this is a group that has a much higher risk. The literature on this group is pretty robust that opioids plus other centrally acting drugs are much more dangerous than opioids alone. So this is what I would call low-hanging fruit uh, in terms of risk reduction. And fi finally, patients whose underlying pain issue may have resolved. And this one seems kind of crazy, but it goes something like this. Imagine you have a patient with a complex ankle fracture. They undergo surgery. They're non-weight bearing for a long time. There's an extensive period of rehabilitation. These are very painful surgeries. And it's not unusual for patients to be on opioids for 16 weeks, by which time they've developed a physical amount of dependence on this drug. And when they try to stop, the doctor perhaps says, hey, it's been 16 weeks. Why don't you stop taking the Norco? And the patient says, OK. That ankle pain recurs. And so to the patient, they say, something's wrong. My surgery wasn't successful. Something's wrong. I need to be on opiates. I still have ankle pain. But what that may, in fact, be is a demonstration of withdrawal, even from having been on it as prescribed for just four months, and that if you got this patient all the way through their withdrawal and out the other side, there might be no more ankle pain because one of the bugaboos around opioids is that an early sign of opioid withdrawal is a return or escalation of the pain for which the drug was first prescribed. It's amazing. The body remembers. So that's another group that I think these are um, kind of my top list of people that I think are good targets. So who's not a good target? That's the next question. Well, addicted patients, and that might surprise you. If I make the diagnosis of addiction, and now that's not the diagnosis of dependence. That is the diagnosis of addiction, and it's different. If I make the diagnosis of addiction, I do not taper these patients, because one of the hallmarks of addiction is inability to control your use. And so if I have a patient and they're on 10 oxycodone a day, and I decide that addiction is what's going on here. If I give them nine a day this week and eight a day next week, they will just take whatever they take. They're not tapering at all. They're just running out faster. So addiction is also a disease that really requires treatment. Abstinence is not the treatment for addiction. And so these patients, when you make this diagnosis, need an easy, quick, reliable road to treatment. Palliative care patients, this might seem obvious, but I get referrals to taper these patients. A palliative care patient is a patient where we're no longer using opioids to improve function. A palliative care patient is a patient where our model has changed to one of comfort, and our tolerance for risk goes up because there is presumably something more dangerous and more life-threatening going on. Where does palliative care start? Different people have different ideas about it. Is it in the last six months of life, the last year of life, the last five years of life? 
I think that is a something every individual group needs to have a conversation about. What constitutes palliative care? When is somebody palliative care? And how do we kind of make that transition from pain, chronic benign pain, to palliative care? I do not think, at least at the primary care level, psychiatrically fragile or unstable patients should be taken. And that's too bad because often these are the patients on the highest doses. But these patients really need a higher level of supervision, of care. They need a multidisciplinary team. They need, and I think if they're going to be tapered, they really need to be tapered by uh, an expert in the field. This is not something I think that can be done at the primary care level. And often, even I won't do it. So, um, and I don't think we should table, taper pregnant patients, again, at least at the primary care level. All right. So I call this slide the reasons not to not taper. And these are all things patients have actually said to me about why they sh think they should not have to taper their opiates. Um, number one, it takes the edge off. Well, I just think that that may be true, but this drug should be, given the risks we know around this use of opiates, it should be doing a whole lot more than taking the edge off. So I don't think we're getting a good risk-benefit analysis. The other thing I believe patients are saying when they tell you this is that they take a dose, they're okay, four hours, six hours, time for their next dose. They're starting very often to already be in withdrawal. That edge that they're telling you about is the edge of opiate withdrawal. And yes, of course, the next dose takes the edge off of that and makes them feel better, although it's usually not addressing their pain. But that's not a reason to remain on opiate. Similar to that is the person who says, I, I have more pain when I skip a dose, so I know it is doing something. Can't compare the pain you have when you don't take an opiate when you're dependent, because again, what you're feeling is increased pain related to dropping serum drug level. Similar with, I tried to stop before and my pain got out of control. Those are all people who are telling you that withdrawal is presenting a problem for them. Uh, another thing I sometimes hear is patients using these drugs as performance enhancing drugs. Uh, it's the only thing that lets me work 16 hours a day. I can't figure skate competitively without these drugs. But opiates are not performance enhancing drugs. And if your patient is using these to be able to do something that they could not do without them, that's not really an appropriate use of opiates. We can improve their function so they can do something, but I'm not sure anybody should be working 16 hours a day. And I'm not sure I want to be prescribing a drug that supports that kind of behavior. And the avoidance of withdrawal is not a reason to remain on opioids long term. OK, so uh, if you agree with this, let's do a show of hands. Titrating opioid doses up over time to compensate for tolerance can be a successful long term strategy for helping chronic pain patients manage their pain. Let's see a show of hands if that's a strategy that you employ or you think is a valid strategy. We'll hopefully at the end have time to kind of discuss this. So there's several types of tapers when you're tapering opioids. There's a physician-directed taper. That's where I say take this much today and that much tomorrow. And there's a patient-directed taper where I give the patient an amount of opiates and I say take up to this amount, but try to take less and let's see how you do. And it can be a very successful strategy. I'm not going to actually present a case on this strategy today because the truth is I think most of us do predominantly physician-directed tapers. There's three other types of taper. The rapid taper, which is one prescription given to a patient that takes them from whatever dose they're on to zero. And it might look something like take 10 pills today and nine pills tomorrow and eight the next and so on and gives them one and gets them off. It's not a very successful strategy. It almost never works. It will, uh, it's used mostly, how do you put this politely? It's used 
to cover physicians who no longer want to prescribe for a patient but don't want to be accused of abandoning a patient. But I'm not sure it's necessarily uh, medically very feasible because really the patient's going to take whatever they take and then they're going to run out and they're going to be right back where they started from. Uh, the group taper can be very, very effective uh, but is a bit more resource using. And the most resource intensive patient taper is an inpatient taper, which I almost never, never, never have to even think about doing. But it, but it is something that can be done in certain situations and it can be very successful. So here are my rules of thumb for tapering. This is kind of the one slide of what you need to know about how to approach this. The longer someone's been on, the slower you have to go. I figure that oh, tapers take about 20% of the time that a patient's been on. So a patient who's been on for a year probably takes a couple months to get them on. A patient that's been on for 10 years or more probably going to take you two years. So these are labor intensive. If there's a medication that the patient does not use daily, such as uh, medication for breakthrough pain, I just stop it and I just get rid of it right off the bat and then start tapering whatever is being used daily. You probably, if you're using something once a week, twice a week, even three times a week, it probably can be stopped without a taper. I like to use what I call one small currency opioid. And what this is, Patients nowadays, they're on the fentanyl patch, and they're on some uh, long-acting oxycodone and some hydrocodone for breakthrough pain. And trying to figure this all out just makes you want to pull your hair out. So in most cases, I add up everything they're on and convert it to something. Um, or I take the op one of the opiates that they're on, convert everything else over to that one opiate, and taper down. On that way, you can't taper somebody who's on 80 milligram tablets of OxyContin because you need to be able to make those adjustments very small in the same way you can't buy a pack of gum with a $100 bill in most places. So something that comes in 1 milligram or 2 milligrams or 5 milligrams, those kinds of uh, denominations, if you will, are the best for tapering. Down is easier than off, and truthfully, and sadly, most of these patients never get off. We get them down, we get their risk reduced, we get their function improved, we fix a lot of things, but most of these patients are going to be on for the rest of their life. The first third is easier than the second third, so going from 100 to 65 milligrams a day is easier than going from 65 to 35, and from 35 down to zero is the hardest. So we usually shoot for getting people two-thirds of the way reduced. Most patients will tolerate a 10% reduction in their dose. But remember, as the dose comes down, the 10% gets smaller. No one tolerates 25%, so don't even try that. It's been advocated, but it, it, the body just can't take that kind of a drop without pretty significant withdrawal. And going slowly is always better than stopping or giving up. The best taper is the one that works. And patients are different. And different patients need different things. And you really have to design a taper that works for that particular patient. And you want to believe that this patient is best off going slowly with you than getting pushed past where they feel they can go and and leaving your practice and going to someone else who perhaps won't take as much care uh, or might even escalate them back. And once off, if you do get them off, patients are at a risk for the, somewhere between one and five years of returning to chronic daily opioid use. And this is one of the saddest things I see. I can work really, really hard, have what I consider a huge win get somebody all the way off, only to have them come back to me a couple years later back on opioids. So we'll talk a little bit about why that might be, but that's uh, something that really, especially in a, I know I'm talking to people who work in residency situations, is really important. If somebody's off, 
and that doctor graduates, the doctor replacing them needs to be aware of what has happened and transpired to avoid just starting this all back up again. It, it's often when a patient changes doctors that the opiates start up again. Okay, so I'm gonna present some cases now. This is a man I saw in 2010, 55 years old at the time, with low back pain since the 1980s. Multiple surgeries, and is, he's left with constant low back pain without radiation to his legs. He also tells me when I see him that he's got this new chest wall pain that he's had for a couple of weeks since he fell off the toilet. He tells me he has difficulty urinating and he's permanently disabled. He's had nine previous knee surgeries, a history of melanoma in 1991, so he was pretty young, right, about 35 at that time, history of interstitial nephritis that required a stint in the ICU and dialysis, history of alcohol abuse he's been active in, Alcoholics Anonymous since 1983, and openly admits to me, I have a history of abusing carbisoprodol, diazepam, codeine, oxycodone. In fact, he says, the only thing I don't abuse is methadone. So, not surprisingly, he's on methadone, but I want you to make sure you can see what his dose is. So this is a, taken from his medical record. He's getting 1,800 tablets a month of methadone taking 15 tablets, 150 milligrams of methadone, four times a day. Pretty high dose. Two years ago, and old records are your friend here, he was on a quarter of that, 40 milligrams a day. Um, and that's a sign to you. When someone has had a rapid doubling of their dose or quadrupling of their dose over a relatively short period of time, you're probably dealing with hyperalgesia. Because at this point, the drug is causing, as soon as you increase the dose, the pain goes up, the dose then gets upped, traditionally to compensate for that, the pain goes up, it's like pouring gasoline on a fire. And that's really when we see these people really on exorbitant doses, that's almost always what's driving it. So, uh, I'd like a show of hands now on the subject of low back pain. I, I don't know how many of you are treating physicians out there, but if you are a treating physician or have ever been a treating physician, um, if you have ever successfully treated even one patient with low back pain without radiation, so not radicular pain, just plain old ordinary low back pain, if you've ever treated that successfully in anyone with anything that you've prescribed, Raise your hand. Yeah, well, I've asked this now to probably over 5,000 physicians. I've never seen a hand go up. There is no evidence that opiates work for low back pain. There's no evidence that they don't, but there is no evidence that they do. And axial low back pain is incredibly difficult to treat, and I have never personally successfully treated anyone, nor have I ever met anyone who has. So I think one of the messages, especially to the younger physicians, so that they don't develop a bad habit, is don't prescribe anything. Put the pen down. That's what I say to residents. Put the pen down when somebody says they have low back pain without radiation. If you give a drug that you know can't possibly work, all you're doing is injecting risk into the situation. Okay, so here's some more on that patient. He's got hypertension, he's being treated, he's on, got hyperlipidemia, depression, he's on 60 milligrams of citalopram, that's a very big dose, and he's got a PHQ-9 of 19 indicating moderately severe depression, or libido, no sexual function. He's got sleep apnea that is not being treated. He has been diagnosed with a bladder outlet problem. He's being seen by uh, the Kaiser Permanente urologists who seem to be stymied by this problem, um, but they have him on medication for that. Chronic nausea, taking promethazine four times a day, and again, this history of melanoma and interstitial nephritis. Now, this is an interesting list. Would you believe that every single one of the things on this list could be caused by that methadone? Every single one of these. 
I'm not saying that they are. There's lots of people with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and depression who don't take opiates, but opiates can cause or contribute to all of these. So here's his physical exam. He's alert, oriented, and appropriate. He's pale, puffy, slightly feminized features. He's overweight. He walks with a cane. He has allodynia everywhere, right? Touch him anywhere, and he says, ouch. Even the light touch, gentle touch, that is hyperalgesia. Um, everything is painful. He is exquisitely tender along the left mid-axillary line. He's extremely deconditioned, and his x-rays reveal a fractured rib on the left. That's presumably from, remember, falling off the toilet. Okay, so we work these patients up. We do what's called the, the best workup, bone density, EKG, sleep study, and a total AM testosterone in men. And this is what he looks like. Uh, 469 is his QT corrected interval. It's a little on the long side for me. 41, you might be surprised to find out, is his total testosterone, also extremely low. 75 is his oxygen saturation nadir at night while he sleeps. And minus 2.4 is his T score, indicating that he is 0.1, minus 2.5 is the threshold for osteoporosis. So we take all of that. Uh, and we put that into our model. But I'm going to digress for just a minute on methadone in particular and EKG changes. This is something I don't think we do a good job of monitoring. And this is part of what I mean when we patients have risk associated with opioids, and it's our job to mitigate that risk as much as possible. These are the recommendations. I'm not going to go over these individually. But they do say if you're going to use methadone, Pre-treatment EKG, EKG after 30 days or 30 days after any dose adjustment, annually in all patients, more frequently if they're on over 100 milligrams where they have unexplained syncope or seizure, right? This guy fell off a toilet. Could that have been a syncopal episode? Could that have been an arrhythmia from his methadone? We could be. And at I like to see the EKGs in all of my patients under 450. And that really has to do with the interactions of other drugs. My patient population is a well-insured, well-managed population for the most part. So they're not on just methadone. They're on methadone and an SSRI. And they go to urgent care and they get an antibiotic for their bronchitis. They go on a cruise ship and they take an antiemetic. Now, this guy's already on antiemetics and SSRIs, but the point is that that QT prolongation is additive with each drug that interferes with it. And if you want to know sort of the magnitude of the problem, this is a study that looks at methadone and cardiac death done in Oregon. They looked at 178 people with sudden cardiac death. 72 of them were positive for methadone on autopsy. And of those, only 23% had a cardiac explanation for why they might have died, it meaning coronary artery disease or structural heart problem, as compared to the 106 not on methadone, or 60% did. So these patients are probably not universally dying from overdoses. They're dying from cardiac problems that are preventable completely. This is another... Uh, study looking at the root causes of opioid-related deaths. And as you can see, methadone over here or far on the right blows every other opiate out of the water. This is a risky drug. And the question of whether this drug should even be on a formulary for pain at the primary care level is certainly a question that should be looked at. Um, looking at the testosterone issue, this is a paper that my group did recently looking at the odds ratios of long versus short acting opioids. And so what we found was opioids are universally associated with low testosterone levels in men, but there's a almost six times higher risk if you take a long acting opioid than a short acting opioid. And again, this is a curriculum change because 
the curriculum that I was taught and that I see residents to this day being taught is if they need to be on an opiate, put them on a long-acting opiate. So there's no evidence to support that statement whatsoever. It's never been shown that they work better or that they're safer. And in fact, we see here that possibly they're not. Okay, one more thing, which is bone density. Studies, should all men be screened for bone densities? Well, you can see this is a study that looked at 81 men on opiate, and they've divided them out, those who were hypogonadal, low testosterone versus non, normal, osteopenic, and osteoporotic results on their bone density studies. And what you see is that even the non-hypogonadal men, 34% of those are osteopenic and another 8% are osteoporotic. So probably even in men with normal testosterone, they're losing bone density. This affects women too, by the way. So what does his little risk-benefit instrument look like? Well, let's color it in. It looks like this. And I gave him a yellow for polypharmacy for that promethazine because it does cross the blood-brain barrier, but it's not like a benzodiazepine or something. He's got a lot of risk. And you know what? We weigh that against What's the drug doing for the patient? He's still screaming in pain when I touch him. So this one's pretty easy, right? Um, and in fact, when they've looked at the expectations that patients have with opiates versus what they actually get, what patients want to get in terms of pain relief is about 50% reduction. What do they actually get? A little under 12%. The same thing for emotional distress, fatigue, and interference with their daily life. What they actually obtain is nothing even close to what they want from that drug. So we think it's pretty easy to say it's not working. All right, so now we've gone through that. Should we taper this guy? I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands because it's kind of uh, a leading question there. We decide we're going to taper him off his methadone. So let me see a show of hands of people who feel very comfortable at this point in designing and executing an opioid taper. The tapering mantra, for those of you who want to get a little more comfortable, is if it goes up, it can come down. And it comes down the same way it goes up. And it's also important to remember that opiate withdrawal is not dangerous. It's miserable, but it's not dangerous. You're not going to kill anybody if you try this and you don't quite get it right, and the patient is in withdrawal. They may end up in the emergency room, they may be a little angry, but nothing bad is gonna happen to them. Now that is not true for other drugs, but opiate withdrawal, unless there's a congestive heart failure or some very delicate physiology, this is not a dangerous process. However, specifically with methadone, the success rate's almost zero. So, what we have here, and in, in the slide deck you're going to get, this is a live link, and I uh, apologize if this is a little bit small. This will let you choose the opiate you're going to taper and the denomination of those pill sizes. His are 10, but I put five underneath there because you can split them in half. And what, how many pills he takes, remember he takes 15, four times a day, It figures and it calculates the daily dose. It then lets you put your goal dose. I put zero here. The interval, that's how many weeks between changes. So I'm going to change him once a month. Methadone, you have to go slow. Um, and it gives, if you click on, this isn't live, but in the live version, these little red links are help. But you put the date you're going to start and the percentage reduction that you are wanting to do. And these will populate for you. And it tells you sort of day by day, or in this case, month by month, what their dose is going to be. So you can see we're going to start on the 4th of May with going from 600 to 570, which is a 30 milligram change. It tells you the number of pills the patient takes per day, 57, and the number of pills you need to dispense in order to get him to his next refill. I give one of these to the patient. I put one in the chart. There's no issue that way with um, any confusion. But you can see we can go down by 30 milligrams a month for quite a while, but then we have to go down by 15 and later by 10 and later by 5. So you can make a big piece of progress quickly, but it slows down a lot. All right, so 
six months later, his pain is no worse, and he's on half the dose, 320 milligrams. And he says, my pain is the same, but I'm better. And that's what patients will tell you. I'm better physically. I'm emotionally better. We offered him testosterone for his hypogonadism, which he declined at that time. But we forced our patients, if they drive, to have corrected sleep apnea. I do not let patients drive a car with untreated sleep apnea that's caused by opiates. And in this case, he had central apnea caused by the opiates. His QT is now 395, so we've made him better. His risk is lower, and he's better, and the dose is half. So he decides to participate in our multidisciplinary pain program, which is terrific. It takes us another two years to get him completely off methadone. And even then, he's not off opiates. He's on eight milligrams of buprenorphine, which is often the way we end these tapers. But he doesn't use a cane. His sleep apnea is resolved, because he fought us all the way on getting his sleep apnea treated. He hated the machine. But we retested him, no sleep apnea. Testosterone is 222 on its own, normal enough. He's walking every day for exercise. And he actually says, for the first time since the 80s, I'm thinking about working. So here's this is a success story all the way around about making the patient better. How do, Part of this is I'm really honest with patients of what's OK and what's not in terms of feeling sick. I don't let anybody get to the point where they have diarrhea or they can't work. I always give them the option to return, where I say, if, if I'm wrong, if we make you worse by tapering you, I'll put you back on what you were on. Um, I've never actually had a patient ask me to do that. I, we offer a lot of reassurance, education, support, and I always give a treatment plan in writing. I think this is really, really key. There's a lot of anxiety around tapering. Um, patients walk out of the office, but if they were highly anxious, they may not retain everything. So it's really important that they have something that shows every day what they're going to be on and what they can expect. So withdrawal symptoms should be mild. We do use clonidine. Uh, if withdrawal symptoms get to the point of anxiety or agitation. We use Imodium. If there is a little bit of GI upset, Imodium is actually an opiate that doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So putting Imodium back into the system is actually addressing this perfectly. And we use benzodiazepines only for the seven days after the last dose. If we're getting somebody completely off, they've taken their last dose, I'm fine with some Valium or something for seven days, because that can be the roughest part. We slow or hold the taper every time we've done a third of their starting dose. I don't taper people in the month of, from Thanksgiving to New Year's. It's just kind of my winter break, a lot of stress. Um, I try to keep people's, what I mean by watch the clock is, I try to keep people's doses very even. So it's, not enough to say, take 13 doses a day. You really have to say, I want you to take two pills every three hours, or three pills every four hours, even at night. And I do want patients, if, if they're on an immediate release drug, to dose at very strict intervals to avoid intermittent withdrawal. As the dose gets lower, the taper gets harder. We go slower. And the last one on here is, where it says pause is post-acute withdrawal syndrome. And this is probably why patients end up back on opiates. They get all the way off. They are feeling great. Everything, they're done with withdrawal. Six months later, poof, they experience a huge resurgence of their pain or anxiety or some other symptom, often landing them in the emergency room. And what that is is post-acute withdrawal. I don't know why withdrawal shows up again, but throughout that whole first year, and for some drugs like methadone, even longer, any of the withdrawal symptoms can rear their ugly head. OK, so I want to do another one. This is a new case that I'm working on right now. 
Uh, and I'm going to go kind of quickly through the next two cases because I think we've got a lot of the baseline stuff. This is a 58-year-old woman who I first saw in 2011. She has chronic pain since the age of two and estimates she's been on opiates for more than half her life. She tells me she's had 13 concussions in her life, the first at age two, which she describes in very, very graphic terms, and the most recent concussion three months ago. She is the sole caregiver for her grown daughter who was sexually assaulted and now requires round-the-clock care. But interestingly, this daughter is independent and functional enough to come and pick up her opiate for chronic pain. When I see her in the office, her pain is a 10 out of 10, though she looks completely comfortable. And when I ask her, how is your pain at its worst, she says it's a 15 to 20 out of 10. Very dramatic presentation. She says her sleep is good, no problem with sleep. Her bowel function, she says, is normal. Her mood is described as good. Her memory is described as good, though she admits it, it used to be better. When I examine her, she is very well-groomed, well-dressed, woman with a pressured type of speech and very rambling and unfocused. She's 40 minutes late for our appointment because she got lost, but this is Kaiser. I mean, she comes here all the time. Um, neurologically, she's intact. Her, I should say her pain is, is two types of pain. I forgot to put that on the slide. Chronic, constant headaches from her concussion and fibromyalgia. Okay, she's very sensitive to even the lightest touch on her scalp. And she has fibromyalgia type tender points everywhere. This is what she's on. Eight milligrams a day of lorazepam, oxycodone immediate release 30, eight tablets taken five times daily. Plus, she's wearing three fentanyl patches, two patches of 100 and one of 50. She's taking over-the-counter sufedrin, six tablets a day, and she does this chronically for runny nose and sinus problems, right, which can be part of intermittent withdrawal, right? And she's on bupropion 300 milligrams. Now, I look back over her previous six years, and I noticed that in 2005, she was on oxycodone 80 milligrams a day. She's now on... Uh, 1,200 milligrams a day. So that's a big jump. She lost insurance, so we don't have records between 2005, they resume again in 2008. When she returns to uh, Kaiser, she's on 960 milligrams a day plus 250 mics of fentanyl and a milligram of Ativan. 2009, the opiates stay the same, but the Ativan goes to two. 2010, Look what happens to the Ativan. Opiates stay the same. 2011, oh, Ativan is doubling. This is a sign. This Ativan is probably being taken for the anxiety associated with intermittent withdrawal, and the more, uh, and that just gets worse and worse and worse over time. She's now on 1,200 milligrams a day, 250 micrograms of fentanyl, which is when we add all that opiate together, it's 2,300 milligrams of morphine equivalent and 40 milligrams of Valium. And I recommend a taper. I say this patient clearly needs a taper, but the patient declines and says, thank you, no, I'll go back to my primary care doctor. And the primary care doctor chose also to not taper the patient. So skip ahead a little bit. This is 2014. I get a call from the pharmacy that the patient is in the pharmacy very upset, claiming that the pharmacists are writing secret messages on her pill bottles. Um, and I actually see photographs of these. And it's very clear that there is writing on the pill bottle, but that it's from the patient, not the pharmacist. And that the, they're calling her an addict, and they're laughing at her behind her back, and she writes a letter about all of this to very, very high up people. And I'm asked to reevaluate the patient. At this time, between 2000 11 and 2014, she's now on 20 milligrams of Ativan a day and 1,560 milligrams of oxycodone. Her fentanyl remains unchanged. 
this is a case of a patient who does not want to taper. This is what her clinical risk indicator looks like. She's got a, I gave her a screen here for cognitive decline. There really should be another one extending here for psychosis. At very, very high levels, these patients can become psychotic. And if you have a patient on opiates that's high dose and psychotic, this is something to consider. Um, her, her clinical risk indicator doesn't look as bad as the previous one, although truthfully, she's refusing sleep apnea, to be tested for sleep apnea. Um, and she is emphatic that she doesn't want to taper. And normally, I think it's really important to have a patient buy in. But there are situations where we just can't let that be. And at the point that a patient is no longer making rational decisions and their behavior has become un irrational, we, we had to step in. Now, truthfully, this involved high-level administrators, multiple meetings, patient relations, patient ombudsman. There was a lot going on here to be able to sort of force this particular taper, but we did. And this is her taper schedule, you can see. Uh, we started it September 12th of 2014. And here we are at December 2015. We're not exactly where we thought we'd be. So, you know, we should be pretty much off of that oxycodone. So we're, we decided to leave the fentanyl alone and just change the oxycodone. But here we are. Uh, today, I just saw the patient. Her pain is 10 out of 10, but that's the same as it was. So these are really important to document at the beginning of the taper to show that while her pain is a 10 out of 10, she's really no worse than she was. She's, we've tapered her lorazepam down to 6 milligrams, her oxycodone to 270, fentanyl 250. This is still a really high dose. Um, and she is not happy about this, and she tells everybody that uh, the doctors here are trying to hurt her, but she is better. She shows up on time, and we haven't had any more psychotic behavior from this patient. So sometimes you do have to take a little bit of a paternalistic view. All right. The last one, and this one's really quick, is um, a 64-year-old morbidly obese woman with axial low back pain, worse with everything. The only thing that makes it better is medication. And what is she on? She's a different one. She's taking four of the Norco, hydrocodone 10, 325 a day. Low dose, really pretty low dose. She's using half a milligram of Alprazolam at night for sleep. Her dose is very stable, no issues with early refills, lost prescriptions, stolen prescriptions. She's very depressed and admits she cries every day. And she has very limited function, which was even before she was begun on opiates, um, in part because she requires a walker to walk. And this is a functional problem due to that she's five feet tall. She's morbidly obese, and she just can't quite get her legs under her well enough to walk without a walker. Her pain is back pain, but when we x-ray her, it turns out what, it, what she's really experiencing is bilateral hip pain. And what she needs is a hip replacement bilaterally. Okay. She does not want to taper. She begs me not to take her Norco away. And this is what her clinical risk indicator looks like. So disability, depression, and she does have sleep apnea because we checked her. Although her sleep apnea, truthfully, she'd probably have on the basis of her weight alone. But the opiates are probably contributing to that. I gave her a yellow for the pharmacy because she's taking half a milligram of alprazolam at night and a yellow for inability to manage comorbidities. This may be a little bias on my part, but the comorbidity that she isn't managing is her weight. But truthfully, most of our patients aren't managing that. 
So I cut her a little bit of slack there, but this is what she looks like. Now, I want to ask, raise your hand if you'd taper this woman. Anybody want to taper her? Nobody wants to taper her. Okay. Well, what's her biggest risk? Her biggest risk is her morbid obesity, right? And what she needs is a hip replacement, and the surgeons won't touch her because of her weight. She's using the opiates to cover up pain from her hip osteoarthritis that we can't fix because of her weight. The actual way to risk reduce this woman is to get her to lose weight so she can get a hip replacement so we can get her off of opiates. So this is what we decide to do. So you got to use CPAP. That's just kind of one of our rules. And I devise a weight loss plan that says, every month when you come to pick up your medication, I'm going to weigh you. And you need to weigh less. I didn't say how much less. An ounce, I didn't make no rules about that, just less. You need to weigh less than the month before. And if you don't, then I have to wonder if maybe the opiates are part of why you can't lose the weight. And, they, oh, and there's actually evidence that this is true, that opiates tend to create a situation where you crave sugar and it's very hard to lose weight. And this is what happened. So you can see at our first visit at five foot one, she was 310 pounds in June of 2012. By Thanksgiving of 2013, she was at 250 pounds. Pretty impressive. The surgeons, by the way, said, oh, we'll do a hip replacement if she can get to 250. So in nine months, she lost 10% of her body weight. She reduced her risk of diabetes, hypertension, the load on her knees, and boy, she felt better. And at that point, I said, I offered her bariatric surgery and said, hey, maybe we can get you some weight loss surgery because you've already lost 10%, which is our requirement for all patients who do weight loss surgery have to lose 10% of their body weight. She said, why would I do that? I'm doing great this way. And so we continued. And she did receive her hip replacements. And after her post-operative course, discontinued all of her opiates. So sometimes the taper is not the answer, right? It's a very individual thing that really requires that you look at risk in a very specific way for each individual patient. What is the biggest risk? How can we make this patient better? Sometimes it's that I can fix something over here. I can't fix this risk over here, but I can fix this other risk over here. And if, as long as you're making the patient better overall, you're moving in the right direction. So she, I talked to her on the phone. She goes back to her primary care doctor. She doesn't see me anymore. And she says, I have a whole new life. I'm not going to stop losing weight until I weigh less than 200 pounds. And I haven't weighed less than 200 pounds since I was a freshman in college. I mean, that's, I go to bed at night feeling pretty good about something like that. The goal, in summary, is to make the patient better. It's not to punish the patient not to make a metric, it's to make the patient better. You have to do a full risk-benefit analysis on each and every patient. You want to design the most appropriate taper and modify that taper as time goes on. We didn't make our goal on any one of those three patients, well, on the first two. It took a lot longer than we planned. The goal is not always off. And so, but sometimes, and this is the second case, you just have to do it. It, was, it, it seems almost cruel to taper somebody um, against their will, and, after, and she is not admitting that she's better. But there's a, sometimes there's a public health or there's some other issue, and you have to just pick up the reins, as it will, and, and take control of the situation. And what the last case, I think, really illustrates is that sometimes opiates are not the biggest problem. And so now I'd like to ask you to raise your hand if you feel like you're confident that 
create and execute a taper for a patient on opiate. You are welcome to call me at any time. Email me, call me. Um, if you're in the middle of trying to do this and you just want to run something by me, happy to help. I was wondering about tramadol. You know, I, I don't feel as, as um, familiar with the pharmacology right. of tramadol. I've got a patient on 120 a month of the 50s, and she's done that for years and years, and she absolutely doesn't want to go down on them. She takes it for leg pain, but she also has these symptoms of restless leg syndrome that I, I think could be from that. Um, but w what's your impression about that medication? Well, so tramadol is a, is a weak opioid receptor agonist, and it, it really is an opioid. They tried to devise the drug as a non-opioid, but it really is, and you do have to taper it. Um, but again, the, the, you know, for a day of 50 milligrams is well under the toxic range, and it's doubtful that that is what's causing the restless leg. One of the things to look at in patients on opioids, I'm glad you mentioned restless leg, excuse me, restless leg, is to really drill down on what they're calling restless leg. Because patients on opioids can develop what are called myoclonic jerks. And that's where a limb uh, moves on its own. And it can be very distressing. It tends to be worse at, at night. It tends to be worse in bed. It's sort of that, you may have ever had this, if you, that feeling when you're just falling asleep and you dream that you're falling and you wake up and everything kind of jerks. You know what I'm, anybody, mm -hmm. a hypnagogic yeah. hallucination? Um, that's kind of what this feels like to the patient, only they're awake and they're more frequent. If that's what they're having, those myoclonic jerks, those are irritating and aggravating. They're just kind of part and parcel of being on opioids. Uh, could you fix it by tapering her? Yes, but at what cost? So I guess this is really well, if everything else, if there's no other problems from the tramadol, she can live with the restless leg syndrome. I would not probably start adding other medications in to treat the restless leg, I mean, unless she has true actual restless leg syndrome. But if this mm -hmm. is myoclonus, I would say this is the, this is, this is just comes with the territory. This is just one of those things. You can try to get, make sure she's taking everything really evenly if she's taking four a day, that should be every six hours with an alarm set to wake her at night. Because the, the myoclonus gets a little bit worse, um, mm -hmm. you know, if she, if she goes too long without it. So I think you gotta do a little sleuthing in there about the tramadol to really drill down and see what's going on. But if she doesn't want to taper and you decide that the what the drug is doing to the patient is more than what the drug is doing for the patient, and you taper her against her will, she will leave you. She will go to somebody else who will give her what she wants, but yeah. may not do as good a job of taking care of her. So I think in that way the patient loses. So I usually don't taper people until they're ready. But you can have a conversation that says, hey, let's watch this for a year. Um, you know, let's let's agree to talk about tapering every six months or something like that. And but I probably wouldn't escalate the dose. Do you use the long-acting tramadol? I am a little bit unique in that in my practice I avoid long-acting anything. 